Hello everyone, welcome to another exciting installment of the Film Biz Show. My name is Marcus Mabusela and I'm joined by my co-pilot, Ms. Judith Kamanga, and the man with the plan, Mr. Kevin Kumalo. Now today, we are touching on a topic which we have been desperately wanting to delve into. Marketing and PR within our business. You can market something to the dead, but at the end of the day as well, word of mouth counts. Like, there, there are some films that I've worked on and, and you know it's a really shitty film. <laughs> but, but the thing is, because word of mouth, right? But you make sure that all of your marketing assets sell it to be something else. How many times have you seen a trailer and you're like, ah, oh, damn, I need to go watch this. And you sit there and you're like, ah, oh, damn, I wasted 160 bucks on a movie ticket. Um, but that's because the marketing assets took you there. And that's why in cinema specifically, you bank on that opening weekend. You make sure that you market it so much that by the time it releases, everyone is queuing outside to watch it. Because best belief by Monday, people are talking about how shit that film is and no one's coming to watch it on Tuesday. That's just how it works. But what we need to be thinking about is how do I make a film that will stay past Monday? Please subscribe, like, comment, and turn on the notification button so you are aware of our future episodes that you will love so much. We have a very exciting guest, a good friend, someone who was always, I believe, the life of the party, a good conversationalist, my good friend, Ms. Neo Moretwe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get get the nerves, you know, take the nerves away. You know, the life of the party. Oh, you know, life of the party. You know, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a long time thank coming. You. Um, you know, now you have over an, a decade's experience and you've been around the block in terms of, you know, this business. Um, you were second generation um second generation filmmaker within your family. Mm. So you come you come far with this, you know, um, you know, this thing that we do, this craft, um, what is it that got you into the space initially? I think everything in this space made me not want to be in the space. <laughs> Second generation. Um, it really was by chance. Um, I was very intentional about not being in, in, this, in this industry from a young age. Like at a young age, I was like, ah, oh, maybe I'll do the TV thing. Um, but then in high school, I got exposed to a teacher who was like, maybe, so just to give you context, in high school, I received two awards in matric, most promising student in business and most promising student in art. Interesting. I know. Mm. And then my art teacher then said, why don't you do the business side? You know, um, you're interested in fashion, so try the business side of fashion. Um, and then what I then did is I focused in on um, buying and merchandising. So that was my first degree um, with a focus on fashion retailing. And then after that, um, I got absorbed by a communications agency, like right after school. Um, and then I just took the marketing and comms route um, and I forgot about fashion and I forgot about everything else. And then at some point, on this journey of having to service all of these FMCG brands, I then found, um, how do I put it? I found a newfound passion of the business side of the arts again. Yeah. Um, because whilst I was working with all these brands, we were sponsoring so many creatives and so many parties and so many events that, um, I was like, maybe I should just go back and but on the business side of things. And then I thought, should I go to fashion or should I go, you know, into film? And then I worked for a production company and I found the, the filmmaker to be pretty useless. Um, and then I fired him <laughs> as a boss. Um, and then I decided, you laugh, but I, he really <laughs> was useless. <laughs> um, the thing direct. is, I had I'd worked with all these brands and I, and I'd worked on partnerships and collaboration that... I was like, okay, when I entered here, I was like, you need money. I know exactly how to get it, you know. And I had so many people that were interested in, 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 in giving the money. They just needed a sign-off. And this guy would just float and not do it. It's like the platter has been given to you. All you have to do is take the piece of chicken mm. and eat it, mm. you know. Um, and then eventually I fired him as my boss. I love um, that. <laughs> I love that. 
You hear that, creatives? <laughs> she fired her boss. <laughs> I did. Different way of thinking. And then I went to Cape Town and I pitched this sales and distribution company in film, which is also, also had a production company. And I said, I'm brilliant, you have to hire me. Mm. <laughs> um, and I was like, this is why. And I broke it down. Um, and I was like, my skills are in sales and distribution and my, um, you know, my qualifications are in distribution. So trust me, you need them both. Um, and they were like, mm, we don't have any vacancies. So <laughs> no, but they took, I had printed out my CV at the time. You know, we had those printouts and I had a, a USB of my CV on there as well, just in case, you know, and I gave them this piece of paper with my CV. It was like probably like four or five pages um, with my CV. And I was like, yeah, if you change your mind, my number's on the first page. And I, and I didn't have a car. And I took a train back. Um, How long did Cape that take? Town. <laughs> it was like a 20 minute train ride. Okay. Um, and then I walked from where the train stops to home. It was like uphill for another 30 minutes or 40 minutes. Oh. I got home and I was like, damn, what did I do? You know, I've left corporate <laughs> and and now I've like sold myself this dream of working in a company where I get to do both the business and the arts. Um, and like two hours later, I get a phone call like, can you come in tomorrow? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm there. And then the following day, I went in dressed in my power suits for, uh, to a production company. <laughs> production companies in Cape Town. Don't wear suits. No. <laughs> Stop there. No. <laughs> um, and they're like, well, um, we have this partnership for internships um, with one of these entities. Would you, would you be willing to take a pay cut? And then we will supplement. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I'm like a single mom. You know, my daughter's like two. <laughs> so I'm just like, yes, whatever it is, I'm in. Um, and I haven't looked back. Uh, I worked for the production company and then I worked for... Um, the National Film and Video Foundation. Um, after I left the NFEF, I worked for Empire Entertainment, which is a distribution company that um, looks at licensing international uh, studio films. Um, so you work directly with the studios. So from Warner Brothers to MGM, they were still um, their own company, to A24 to Amblin, Lionsgate, like all of the different um studios and then so I led a lot of the or I led all of the digital marketing campaigns in South Africa and then after that I joined Yellow Bone Entertainment mm -hmm. where I headed their marketing and, and communications um, and they are one of the best in the country um, as a lot of people would know and then now I'm at um, Known Associates um, group which is a really it's a company that's ahead of its time yeah. in this country and and we can almost call it a studio <clears throat> at this point well um because they have the value chain from production scripted and unscripted to um owning 100 percent of moonlighting films which is a you know a film production mm. or a servicing uh company the biggest on the continent mm. Um, they have a stake in the refinery, which is a post-production um, facility. Um, there's, you know, in the scripted and unscripted, it's known associates entertainment and um, zero gravity. But there's many other films, um, other companies within the group. And then on the side, I have um, I have a business called The Brain Engine. And it really is focused on strategy for creatives. Um, it's, it's basically marketing, PR and strategy for creatives. So if you have two rand, what do I do as a creative? Um, and then I have with a partner, Tabor um, co-founded, uh, co-founded a film club, which is called the secret film society. And what it is, is everything's a secret except for the cinema, um, the time, and yeah, so all you really know is this, the cinema, the time, and maybe the age restriction. So we don't know what we're going to watch. You don't know what you're going to watch. There's no branding. There's nothing. All you know is what you know when you get to the cinema. It's crazy. And you only know <laughs> what you're watching when the, the lights go on and the film starts to play. Okay. Um, and, and the whole point around that is just to um, 
drive audiences back to the cinema, make you feel, you know, give you that authentic experience back into the cinema, engage about film, see what's working, what's not, what's making you go to the, you know, what made, what would make you decide to go to the cinema to watch a certain genre, you know? Mm. Um, Funny, when you're talking about that, sorry to interject. Go for it. I was looking at um, an interview and they were interviewing Matt Damon. Uh -huh. And he was talking about a film that he approached a studio with. And this is a this is you know this film is is um, the kind of film that he grew up loving. You know, mm -hmm. um, he loved watching films that have to do with um, sort of like intimate relationships, uh, family orientated kind of films. And um, as soon as he sat down with the studio, uh, they said, "Look, man, I mean, the, the space has changed, and uh, there's so much more that goes into the ecosystem right now. And uh, you know, these films used to work in the '90s." when the model was you know this way now that we've we've gone to streaming you know the kind of stories that we tell have changed and uh just 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 to kind of touch on that you know i mean it's, it's almost mm -hmm. like we've had to change the kind of stories that we tell to accommodate the, the new distribution model don't you find mm -hmm. i i think it, it is that but i also think audiences are exposed to a lot more now like um pre-covid i would have never watched a korean film or Korean series, mm. uh, um, series that has 52 episodes. It's like an hour and a half each. But what was Goodness. I doing? Watching, Watching Korean that. films, <laughs> <laughs> crying with them. Yeah. Um, but, but what COVID did, right, is in the beginning, audiences were already trickling down. There was a decline in terms of how many people were going to the cinemas. Then what we then saw is that because of COVID, we had hard lockdown at home and you were forced to then watch series at home. And so then these streamers had to come up with the content, right? And what do they do? They increase the libraries of the content that we could watch. And then we're exposed to a lot more of a variety. <laughs> but that's basically what happened. There was a shift. And if you look at, at the shift now is that you, we went from Korean watching films to action-packed Jackie Chan films to whatever it is to now people are binge watching like reality crime shows mm. and that's where audiences are and that's where, what streamers are looking for mm. you know and and a lot of the streamers are also looking for like known IP because then you already know there's an audience there now your expertise do cover like you know the entire value chain of the film business from the marketing right down to the you know distribution phase what you know, like what strategies you kind of implement, you know, as you go from each phase, from concept development, distribution, post-production, other specific processes, the processes that you know that you implement uh, to make sure that each stage, you know, gets its uh, fair share of attention with regards to marketing? Yeah, I think, and I'm going to try and answer it as, as correctly as possible. That's but, um, fine, there's no right or wrong. It's so important, and, and what a, lo a lot of local filmmakers don't do is that they write the script and they're like, oh, I'm so passionate. You know, mm. it's my story, I have to tell it, and then, and then, and But what you need to be doing if you really want your film to travel is at script development phase already, start thinking about um, what is commercial about your story? What would make it travel outside of your house? Because then you're making it for your, yourself and your family. And they're going to sit there and be like, oh, you're brilliant. Mm. And then my Kelowna next door is just like, ah, <laughs> I What's wouldn't this? pay money for that, you know. Yeah. But what you do is that from script phase already, you start thinking about the marketing. So as you write your script, you're like, okay, which brands can I bring on board if I were to bring them on? So if I'm sipping on a cup of tea and you know that there's that little tag that's written X brand, you know, <laughs> <laughs> then you already know that there's a there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity at different touch points. And and you can start that at script development side already. And then you can already start looking at if you're to start a marketing campaign, what type of campaign would it be? Would it be about, you know, um the story about Marcus falling in love with his cup of tea? Um, okay, what type of PR stuff? What type of, you know, who which who talks about tea a lot? What type of brands are there? Like, start thinking about that, you know? And and I get a lot of filmmakers don't, but if you're a storyteller, tell us the story. Bring other brands into the story if you want to bring in money. 
And then some people just have the money because then they just apply for funding and the funding is there. Mm. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> but chances are you need gap cover. You need additional funding to do certain things for your production. And it doesn't hurt to have extra money for your production, you know? Um, but then you start that script development phase. And then when you're in production, you are then, you've already thought about, and even before production, you've already outlined, okay, um, what type of marketing assets do I need before we go into production? So outside of the cut downs, and, and look, with big studios, what they do is that they've broken down the story and each, and, and you would have as a filmmaker, you would have said, this is each character's storyline. You know, this is their back story. Um, but what studios do is that they take the back story and they create cut downs on that so that that would target Marcus. That would target a Kevin, you know, and, and that would target that audience. And that would target a now because that was a story about now, you know, an audience that's like now that would find now interesting. Um, and they've already ma mapped all of those things out. And, and when you go into production, you've already ma mapped out when the behind the scenes stills will be taken because already, you know, a writer's been brought on and you already know that the writer has this vision. And then in that vision, it's like, oh, on this day, there's going to be a flying car, you know. And in the flying car, like, oh, shit, maybe we should take some BTS on that. Um, and then you have... You know, you bring in the photographer and the photographer um, takes action stills. And you just, all you have to do is, is they'll put aside. So international films have a lot of time to take all of those things. But during production, it's in their production notes and schedule. But we don't even take the time as local filmmakers to, to craft it into the production schedule. When are the action stills going to be taken? No one's thought of that, you know. Um, usually it's just like a screen grab. And we've had this discussion. It's, it's like, but unfortunately, from an entry level to an established <clears throat> filmmaker, a lot of the time, that's what's happening. Mm. No one's thought about actually taking it, but, and, and they think of doing it at the end. Why didn't you just do it on set with the, the, the character in makeup, in costume? Mm. So it's just like, how do you, um, you know, how do you map it out? But map it out at the beginning so that you don't have to incur the costs at the end of production. You know, you don't have to bring in the actors back again. You don't have to bring in a photographer because you've already thought of doing that on set. Now, now <clears throat> you know, I think another challenge that we're facing within our landscape is that, I mean, clearly with, uh, with what's been happening in the space, of, in the music space with Ama Piano and all that, other cultural exports that we have, being our comedy, uh, our fashion, clearly there's a desire and there's an interest in South African culture. Mm -hmm. But somehow it's struggling to, to translate in the film space. For some reason, we are struggling to strike a chord with an international audience for them to be interested in our stories. What do you think we are missing as local storytellers? Sure. So to be honest... Yeah. Our filmmakers are not commercial. Mm. It just and, and and unfortunately most streamers, most platforms want hyper local, right? Hyper local is great, but where's the commercialness of it all? Like you know, sometimes you're like, ah, oh, the story is commercial because it's a love story and 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 but it's like I'll give you an example. Um one year we were there was a big studio that approached us and we hadn't done distribution for them. Um, at the time, and and they had this. Um, it's a filmmaker from Sierra Leone. Siri, Sierra, Sierra Leone. Leone thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, and she had made this beautiful film, and she was based in the U.S. Um, and they were ready to release this film on a specific, you know, platform, but they really wanted a theatrical release in Africa. And. We're like, okay, we'll shop it around. We'll see how it goes. And, you know, in South Africa, we're like, ah, maybe we'll get X amount. But when you go to other territories, they're just like, no, why would we even watch that? Just because it's a black person doesn't mean yeah. it's going to work in the territory. Mm. And that's with so many different, you know, productions, international coming in even. Mm. You'd be surprised how many international productions don't even make it here. 
or, or other parts of Africa because it, the story just doesn't resonate. Mm. Um, or they'll do terribly in cinema, but they do okay on a streaming service, you know. And that's because, just because it works, just because it has black people doesn't mean it's going to work. True. You know, your story needs to be really good. And when I say story, I mean story from when they switch on their streamer or by the time they sit on and that screen goes on. You know, in the first 10 seconds, if you haven't, you know, captured me, I'm changing I'm the gone. channel, whether you're an international film or local care. film. Mm. And we need to start thinking like that. Yeah. Like, what captures me in mm. your story? But no, they, they say, you know, with the international market, it's all about names. Do you think it's true? I mean, and, and that's, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of addressing our, our struggle with selling uh, locally made films internationally. Do you think at times it's because it they don't know our guys? Look, sometimes you win. Sometimes you win and then there are stories that no one's ever heard of and you just have a really good campaign that propels your story forward because the right people are talking about it. Um, like Tootsie. Like Tootsie. But Tootsie was helped because of, you know, the award and, and, and. Okay. But um, it really needs to be, how do I put it? you really do have to think about the names, unfortunately. International films do it. They bank. When they go, when an international film is looking for funding or financiers, they really bank on the names. Like outside of a shit-hot director and a shit-hot story, they're like, oh, but wait. You know, we have this actor and this actor. And people buy into it. The one year, um, my group MD um, in distribution came to me and she was like, we've got this film. Um, they're offering it, uh, offering it to us for X amount and it's got this actor. And this actor had just done a international actor, had just done an international series that did really well on the streaming platform. So I was like, look, I mean, the story seems uh, okay, but this guy, if you jump in now, sure, he's really big. You know, you, you know he's, by the time the film comes out, he'll be even bigger. So sure, if you want to invest in the film now. But unfortunately, even some of the big names internationally don't make it here. Like some big names in film don't actually hit the numbers you think they're going to hit. Unless you're Tom Cruise. You know, box offices or, or cinemas is, is, is not where it used to be. Right now you need to be blowing up shit and, sorry, That's blowing true. up stuff. You can swear all, <laughs> all day long, Just don't like worry. Yeah, uh -huh. But, you know, you really need to pull audiences. They need to feel like they need that cinematic experience. Because other than that, I'll just watch it at home on my big screen. Um, but actors, one, yes, are important. But the right actors are even more important. Because some actors have been overplayed. It's just like, ah, this is another person. This is this guy again with the same storyline. Yeah. Just a different, you know, daughter who's getting kidnapped. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question though? Because yeah. I think that's really interesting. But when you, okay, I guess aside from cinema, right? Yeah. We have things like Glasgow. They've got a huge fan base. Mm -hmm. Like, it's insane. And then to a point where it's, we're not just staying in the world. Yeah. They're huge. Like stuff, but all the actors they're really doing. Really Unknown. Right? Is it because we hype it up enough that they're taking the best? We hype it up enough that they're taking the I don't think, well. look, it was marketed really well, but we can't take away the fact that it's shot really well. The story really takes you on this journey, yeah. right? And they target an audience that just hasn't been targeted in a long time. It's, mm. a, it's, a, it's an underserved audience, yeah. you know, and, and they did that. Mm. And, you know, I can tell you now, it's, the story is relatable if you're in any country and you're a group of teenagers trying to do X, Y, Z. But it, it, it's shot really well. It's done really well. And they cast really well. Um, so we can't take away from all of that. But their marketing is also really good. Um, and, and that's just where it is. It's like you can't spray and pray and hope for the best. You need to take a, take a targeted approach. So... They were really good here, but best believe when it, it launched, uh, you know, when you're on a streaming platform and it's a global release, 
everyone's getting access to a new release, whether you're sitting in France, Brazil, when a new film comes out, it pops up there and it says new release. It's right there. And chances are, if you're watching films or, or series that are um, linked um, in genre or type of story or whatever, it's going to get fed to you. And what's going to happen? The first 10 seconds, if you don't feel it, you're going to switch. You can market something to the death, but at the end of the day as well, word of mouth counts. Like there, there are some films that I've worked on and, and you know it's a really shitty film. <laughs> but, but the thing is, because word of mouth, right? Mm. But you make sure that all of your marketing assets sell it to be something else. How many times have you seen a trailer and you're like, ah, damn, I need to go watch this. And you sit there and you're like, ah, damn, I wasted 160 mm. bucks on a movie ticket. Um, but that's because the marketing assets took you there. And that's why in cinema specifically, you bank on that opening weekend. You make sure that you market it so much that by the time it releases, everyone is queuing outside to watch it. Because best belief by Monday, people are talking about how shit that film is and no one's coming True. to watch it on Tuesday. True. That's just how it works. You know, why? Are, and, and unfortunately, not fortunately, but what we need to be thinking about is how do I make a film that will stay past Monday? Now, I mean, with your experience working with these studios or, you know, major production companies, what have you found to be the biggest challenges when it comes to digital promotion of films? Yeah, digital promotion of films. It really, you know, and, and I've said this, it's, 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 you can boost on all the platforms. You can boost till you're blue. Yeah. But you can boost and no one watches the film anyway. <laughs> But also, you need to also think that for the longest time, some platforms had a minimum spend if you're going to boost or advertise. Um, and a lot of filmmakers would not get access to that. Like, you, if you don't have a minimum spend of 40,000 Rand for a campaign, best believe, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have that platform. But what we need to start thinking about is how many platforms are available for free. I'll give you an example. When I say for free, I'll give you one platform, TikTok. TikTok is one platform that will give you reach even if you are unknown. You just have to be consistent in your messaging and you need to be consistent in releasing content. And best believe people are going to buy it at some point. People will buy it. And also make sure that you touch the different beats. So you already know that they target different challenges, they target sounds, they target, you know, they target different things. So how do you best leverage that is authentic to your story? How do you leverage different digital platforms that are free, you know, to, to tell your story and amplify the noise? And how do you then ensure that at the beginning, in my budget, I had a budget that said marketing, mm. and I then have, you know, money to spend on digital. But it's not just digital. There are so many different touch points that you can have outside outside of the phone. I mean, there are digital screens all over the show. Like, how are you negotiating with the, you know, not even to partnering or collaborating with people that own screens? To say, hey, I'm an entry-level filmmaker, but I've, I've told this film and it's really cool and I've got this actor unknown, but, you know, it's going on this platform. Could you please give me a 30-second ad, please, like space? And that's a 30-second countdown, please we can find ways of collaborating in terms of the assets you get or you tell me what you need. But even before you get to what do you need, it's like you've done your research. You're not going there like, ah, Martin, you know, owns a mm -hmm. screen. Abuti, please. Mm -hmm. No. Before you even speak to a person, before you open your mouth, do your research. Because when you go there, you're going to be wasting someone's time if you haven't. Mm -hmm. So before you've even, act, that's why I said it's so important. You think about it at script development phase already. You've already thought, oh, crap, you know, it would be so nice if, you know, my story is a Cassie love story and, you know, they fall in love, they meet in a taxi and they're driving to North and this guy offers his, ear, you know, earphone to listen to music. And like, whatever it is, how do we then, one, look at the person, the brand that has earphones, you know, who owns um, taxi advertising, who owns advertising around word? You know, like there are things that you can actually leverage off 
that you can start thinking about at the very beginning. But don't you find also the problem is that storytellers just know how to talk story and might not know how to talk corporate language and talk what this brand actually aspires to achieve, mm. uh, aspires to achieve in terms of, you know, their KPIs, mm. uh, their reach, how they actually uh, measure audience engagement. And all I have is just this inspired story. So, you know, how, how does a writer kind of translate, you know, their, their creative mm. inspiration into a language that's palatable for the boardroom? So I think filmmakers need to step one back. The biggest problem that I've seen is that filmmakers only make friends with other filmmakers. Yeah. Why? <laughs> In other industries, people meet and they collaborate. And it's a cross-industry you know, industry partnership. Why are we not doing that? If you make friends with people that are in other industries, one, you get access to brands. Two, you get access to information you've never had. And three, you just, you, you get the opportunity to partner with people that know better in an area that you don't know anything about. And that is our biggest problem. It's like, you make this film and you're like, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. And I feel because I know what's happening on social media that you can market a film yourself. You can't. You just, there's so many different touch points. You can't think because you're a filmmaker, you know exactly which audiences, not audiences, which assets you need. Because if I'm trying to sell your film, and, I, and I'm not in distribution, but if a salesperson or a distributor is trying to sell your film, they know different audiences in different territories. So if you feel you know better and your poster is great, it's, it's going to work and locally it's going to be the best, chances are if you go to a different territory, they're not going to like it. There are certain territories that are not even going to take it because there are too many guns. Their territory doesn't deal with guns. So on your post, it cannot have guns. But there are other territories that will add a gun, knowing very well that there isn't even a gun in the movie. It's because you know that the audience will come and watch it because there's a gun. But you'll only ever know that, you know, if you're a filmmaker, if you have friends that are in other industries that will tell you that, hey, or even friends that are in marketing or friends that are in distribution. It doesn't hurt for you to make friends. It doesn't hurt for you to do additional research. We are now in an age of technology where, you know, the chat GPTs, the Javanias, the AI, different apps, they're all available. You can ask them if you don't want to make friends then. But our problem is that everything is based on relationship. If you don't have the relationship, you know, chances are you're not, you're not going to touch those points right, for marketing or for PR even. PR is even worse because PR is based on relationship. It's public relations because there's a relation with a specific entity, person, etc. I've I've worked on films where I've received so much, not even films, even, you know, because I've also worked on the SAFTAs. I've gotten so many or so much coverage just based on relationship where I've received like cover pages and this and that and that. It's a relationship thing. It's like, hey, friend, <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> you know? oh, no, what do you want? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And mm. it's like, so I've got this idea. Mm. And I was thinking maybe for the release, we could do this and this and this and this. What do you think? And they might not be able to meet you at all your touch points, but they might say, I can give you coverage on this publication or that and maybe do an interview here. But filmmakers try to do it all. Why? Businessmen don't do it all. Well, many of them actually do when you start right. out. But you need to be real with yourself to say, I need expertise. Well, if you want your film to be seen by people other than your family and your friends, mm. yes. You need to also be serious. Film is a business. Um, the chairman of, I don't know if it was, um, the group chairman of Known Associates Group, of Joe... Um, uh, Chikapa Piri, or whether it was Gahisho Pape at the IDC, said something very interesting at um, the Durban Film Art. And he said that content, you know, it doesn't disappear after you've watched it. You can monetize. You know, so many times after your film has released in other territories, so you can make, you can just keep making money or film, well, if you own the IP, that is. But, um, 
you can always make money from it. You can always sell it. You can always do certain things with it. You can do collaborations with it. You can, you know, there's so many different touch points. So, and that's a business. That's a business that can make you money for the rest of your life. But you need to also see it as a business in order for you, you know, to be profitable or successful in the space. But yeah, anyway, that's my three cents and yeah. Very interesting. I mean, and um, that, that, that leads us to the question or the, the, the problem that we've been having for the longest time and many guests that we've had on the show, you know, we've been kind of discussing this as to why can't we go to financial institutions and ask them to, to you know, especially private financial institutions or private investors say, hey, please put money in my film. And the real reason is, is because filmmakers are unable to speak the language of the boardroom and say, okay, well, this, if you put one rand into this project, you'll get three rand back within this time limit. It's very difficult for us to prove that. Mm. And uh, are there algorithms and, and ways and, and equations that are currently being developed to say, well, if you have this kind of film, this is how you go to a financier and promise them some kind of return on investment? Yeah, it's tricky because some, of the, some people that have been in the industry for so long can't even, it, it's so hard right now. Audiences have changed, consumption has changed. Even films that made it, made it pre-COVID are not making it now, right? Um, even films that we didn't think would make it are killing it now. So audiences are like so different. But I think the approach is, is different. Like I said earlier, you need to do your research. You can't just go up to a brand or a financial institution and say, sponsor me or fund us. You need to look at, if you look at the annual report or the reporting or even the media publications, like what are the, the, the key touch points? What are they talking about? What are they passionate about? What is the brand about? You know, there are certain brands that are really about um, transformation. There are brands that are really about youth development. There are brands that are about the creative arts. There are brands, but you, you can't just go up to a brand that's about trees and say, hey, give us money. You need to find synergies. You need to look, okay, these are the brands that focus on this and this is the angle that we can take. It's about, you need to have a plan. People just think, oh, I'm just gonna go to this bank, I'm gonna go to the bank. What's your plan? What is your plan? And when you say plan, it's like, okay, I've got this film and we're making this film for this platform. Because just like a festival, you are making a can film. You are making a TIFF film. You are making a Sundance film. You are making an SABC film. You are making a Netflix film. You are making an Amazon film. You are making an Apple TV film. You know, you need to also have that understanding of where do you want your story to live, first of all. And what are the chances you could actually get onto those platforms? And it needs to make sense because all of those platforms have an idea of the type of content that they are willing to, to acquire. But you also need to do your research, go on those platforms, read up, watch the films. So if you know you're from South Africa, look at all the films from South Africa that they've acquired. And, and then you can talk a language that you can, you can be like, oh, I really like this film, I didn't like this film. You know, our film does this. And you've already seen that on your platform, you already have it. That's one, how you target, you know, the platforms or the distributors that will get you onto that platform. And then by the time you go to the brand, you say, I have a, you know, a pre-agreement of sorts um, with a platform. And these are the platforms or these are the eyeballs that I anticipate to see it. So you already know if you're going in the SABC, they've got millions of, of people watching it. I think it's like, you know, Ozalo alone, um, I think at some point made, had like, six million views or something mm. per episode. That's a lot something. of value. But I mean, some of the most watched films and, and, and I had an, a, a very insightful um, person um, talk about this this week. And he was like, um, into, you know, films in the US with the highest viewership sit at 10 million. We're not that far off. But you need to sell that because they're trying to get into those audiences, right? So you have six, I'd, if, if we can do this right, these are the platforms, I'm going on an SABC or whatever platform. These are the eyeballs we can target. These are the campaigns we can have off the screen. So if your institution is about, you know, saving or whatever, 
then this is where the storyline, you can take these cut downs that we will create for you and, and you can use it in these campaigns. You need to have a plan outside of the film itself. The film is great. You say, this is what we'll do. We'll add the logos here. We'll do this and there'll be maybe brand integration here and there and there. But outside of this, where, where does it live? But yeah, I think it's just understanding who you're going to, you know, because a lot of the time you don't have that data. Unfortunately, you don't. Most, most platforms don't give you the data. So a lot of the time, you know, the big production companies or the big companies, they do their own research. And, and that's how they find out the stats. But if you are a Neo who's making a first film about falling in love with a microphone, mm. you know, and it's my first film, I'm not, where do I get the data? Mm. That's the thing. But what you need to be able to say is, this is what I bring. I bring the script that takes us on, on this journey. And this is how your brand comes into play. This is the cast that are tied into it. And these are their numbers. Um, and this is the different cut downs we'll do for you, um, for your brand, because your focus is you're launching a new mug. And this is how we'll help you launch your new mug. You know, it's like, you, but you need to start thinking about those things at development to be like, oh, who could I target? Oh, who do I need to know? What's my hit list? You need a hit list as a filmmaker. I love a good hit list. I've got a hit list for every campaign. Yeah. And my hit list breaks down, who do I need to know from a brand perspective? Who do I need to know from a publishing, a PR perspective? And, and these are the touch points where I'm going to meet them in order to get the publicity that I need. But you need to start thinking about that. And if you want to do it alone, then best believe you need to start thinking about it if you're not going to get the expertise in-house but it's not gonna kill you to bring someone who knows, right? Or maybe you can just ask ChatGPT mm. or Gemini or whatever AI platform you use and, and, and ask yourself like, hey, so <laughs> I've got this film, this is what's gonna target, how do I you know, reach this audience? And they might not give you the answer, but you need to start thinking outside. You'd be like, oh, I'm thinking if I do this or I do that. I used to have this other platform, it's an AIPA and I'd be like, hey, I'm really struggling on the strategy and this is where I am. And that AI would then ask me questions. Mm. And those questions would help me answer my own shit. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you know? But there are so many platforms like that. But we need, you need to start then thinking about those things if you want to work by yourself. How do I maximize with the least amount of it, input? Yeah. So now, I mean, you've worked, you, you've worked for arguably the two biggest independent production companies, you know, in the country, being known associates and Yellowbone. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> it seems like there's been a push, you know, or, or a big interest from young filmmakers to take the independent route, because it seems like that's the only way in which they can create some kind of, you know, residual income uh, in the future as they, as they, as they're gone with the careers. Mm -hmm. My, my question to you is how, how would you, what would you advise independent filmmakers to look out for when creating some of this content? Uh, some of, you know, the, these films and series and, you know, whatever products that they'll, they'll be putting out. Now, I'll tell you why I'm asking this question. I mean, we had, we had a, um, a you know, wonderful, um, you know, uh, young uh, team of uh, filmmakers that came um, on the show and that just... Uh, released an independent film and this was the second one mm -hmm. uh, and the first one that they released they took it to the distributors had an exclusive deal signed and since I think 2019 the film was on the lap of the of the distributors s till now so they they took out I think it was a half of a million or a quarter of a million I can't remember the exact amount but Basically, that was money that they flushed down the drain, and it's because they don't know how to navigate the space as independent, you know, uh, producers. What advice would you give to them? And uh, from from obviously, you know, you you have been sitting on the other side of the veil, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, what have you noticed, uh, you know, uh, in terms of how an independent producer can keep the company afloat? Yeah. That's a hard one. Okay, <laughs> no. First of all, leave the film industry. I'm kidding. Mm. <laughs> you don't want to do it. <laughs> Be an accountant. You need... <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. I think, look, and I'll, and I'll take you on a little trip again. 
because that's what I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Traveler. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I worked at the NFEF, I had the the opportunity to engage with different filmmakers from different levels, different skill sets, you know, like different entry points in their careers or end points, wherever they are in their in their lives. But and it really is and what I saw with a lot of them that just weren't cracking it is that one, attention to detail is at zero. Um, they don't take the time to read what they're getting into. They just agree because the, it's excitement. It's like, I need the bread now. I need the food now. My family's hungry now, right? And so we're just going to agree. And I think also we become so desperate. And I'll say we, I'm just going to throw myself in there. A lot of the time, creatives become desperate that they don't negotiate. And that's a, actually, that's not just creatives. It's just people in general. Um, sometimes you become so desperate, you just agree to whatever. And then you think about it later in your life after you've put your signature on, then you're like, oh, shit, actually, I really shot myself in the foot there. Because this distribution deal says I've given all rights in perpetuity. And perpetuity means forever. forever. Exactly. Mm. And you don't have the rights to that forever? That's crazy, you know? Um, but you, you haven't taken the time. You haven't invested in the project. Yes, you've invested your blood, sweat, and tears because I made this movie and the movie's done. They're not, Right. What, you know, there are so many different platforms that are there to support independent filmmakers now. There is an, an organization, and I forget the name. There's an organization that is independent. I think they're an NGO. And they are a legal entity for creatives. And they are there for free. So how are you not engaging with entities like that? But first you need to take the initiative to research. Because best believe there are so many other entities that can help. If you know you're an independent, how do you go, or how do you not go? Why don't you go to a, an accounting firm that's really successful and say, hey, for pro bono, please help creatives. Please give us 10 or five hours a week to help us with X, Y, and Z. It's the initiative. And yes, you're going to have many doors close on you, but that's what happens. Even th for the most successful people in the world, doors will close. They'll say, oh, I don't see the commercial value, I don't see this, or we don't have the resources, et cetera, but just keep knocking. It's like, I, I can tell you for free, I will never be unemployed, ever. Mm. Like, that's just because of who I am. Because I'll, I'll look for every single hole, loophole, whatever. If, I, if the, you're in my hit list for business or in my hit list for a collaboration or my hit list for something, Best believe I'm going to come at you be like, hi, <laughs> it's me and my mic again. Um, don't you want to buy it? You know, whatever the case may be. And you can be like, no, 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 I don't need the mic. And I'm going to come back later. I'm like, and I'll do my research again. I'm going to look for a different touch point. And they're like, it's me again. <laughs> it's my mic. And I'll give you, and I'll sell you a different side to it, you know. And I'll get to know you in the mix. I won't give up. Because sometimes they'll say no. and be like, thank you for getting back to me. You know, but if you have this or this or this, let me know and we'll find a way to collaborate. A few months later, you look at what they're doing, you come back and be like, I love what you did there, you know? You know, and you don't even talk about yourself. You don't even throw in your microphone, your beautiful microphone. Mm. You don't do that, mm. <laughs> you know? And you, you're like, oh, I love what you did here. And you engage and you engage with someone on the personal level and best believe people want to support Sorry. <laughs> people want to support people that they know personally. And they might not find you now. But best believe next year or in two years' time, they'll be like, yo, Marcus. So we're working on this thing, <laughs> podcasts, and, and we have these mics, you know. Um, but we think your mics are better, actually, from what you told us that one time, remember? And that's, that's how it works. That's how it happens. But you won't get to that point because you only network with filmmakers. <laughs> Do you get me? And no one else. Not a brand, not a this, not a that. And you just like, that's the only way you can put yourself forward.
you know, that's the only way you move as an independent filmmaker. If you know you want to be independent, you need to operate mentally like a big company. You need to start thinking of the bigger picture. You need to start mapping it out. You have a wall at home or whatever you have at home, start writing it all down. This is where my vision is. This is where my content is going to live. These are the people I need to meet. There's LinkedIn for a reason. You just go onto LinkedIn and you write the company's name and you just like start reaching out to like people. And, and don't say I'm looking for a job or I'm like, and don't do the hot sell. Just be like, hey, I really like what you're about when you do the LinkedIn regrets. I, I really like what you're about. Can we link? I'd like to learn more about what you do. Or I'm a filmmaker and I'm so like interested in this industry and, and maybe in, at some point in my career find ways to collaborate. People are game for stuff like that, you know? You'd be surprised. I do it all the time. I'm just like, I, I look at someone up there and I'm like, you're about to be my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on my hit list. And, and that's where we go. But you need independent filmmakers must start thinking like that. And if you can't think like that, make friends that can. You know, someone said to me um, a few weeks ago, she's like, I only make friends with CAs. Ooh. I was like, damn. Okay. So is she a CA? <laughs> no. She's a filmmaker. And guess what? All of her funding has come from people that she's met through these people. It's just like you need to get yourself out of yourself. It's true. It's like we get so like wrapped up in, I'm so passionate about my story. And it's like, oh, I thought about this and I felt like this. And, and this is why everyone has to see it because they're going to feel like I feel. And no, no one cares. cares. <laughs> no one cares. They don't. Mm -hmm. They really don't. Unless you take them on a real journey. Take me on a journey. Don't tell me about your passions. It's like, why should I care about you? Who are you? Why should I take 160 bucks to go watch a movie in Hyde Park Corner and get my reclining seats? Mm. You know, it's a nice experience, but why should I spend my 160 to watch yours? Because then, sure. you know, you're competing with Deadpool versus Wolverine. You're mm. competing against you know, so many different, like, huge films that have cinematic, they've been shot for cinema. Shot for IMAX, you know, if you had a stroke in a call. But like, why should I? And you need to start thinking about that. It's okay if your plan is to release on small cinema chains, but be clear about that. And don't sell yourself this dream that you're going to make 200 million in the box office, mm. you know, if you're targeting a niche audience. You also need to be true to yourself to say, this is realistically my audience. I had an independent filmmaker say, you know, if, if we can do... Two million with this film. I'm thinking, brother, I just saw your film and I don't think two million people are going to see this film. So if you know you want to make two million at the box office, then you need to take that and divide that by the, what an average ticket costs. So if it's like 90 bucks to 100 bucks or to 160, you need to divide that and see how many people do I physically need to get as a bum on the seat. If that's, if that's your vision, then make it happen. It's not that hard. You just need to Strategy. reach enough people, mm. whether you are physically getting your goons to bully people into the queue, whatever the case may be, if that's your strategy, that's your strategy. Mm. But have a strategy. Have a plan. Mm. So now, as the co-founder of the Secret Film Society, which is so exciting. <laughs> I can't wait. Tomorrow we're dropping the first installment. Dun, dun, dun. What inspired you to, to start this initiative, this film club, and what is the overall vision? So look, myself and, and Tabora Messi started the um, Secret Film Society, and, um, and we're both very passionate about driving people back into the cinema. And a couple of years ago, I had pitched um, to have something like this. The difference was is that you could, um, it would be at one cinema, once a month, at the end of the month, and people didn't know what film was playing, they didn't know anything. All they knew is that at that cinema, at that time, the last Thursday of the month, the first 50 people get in for free. Mm. So for me, the rationale was that the first week, or the first month, you make it in, you number 50. It's nice. You don't have to pay. You get your popcorn, your cool drink. You're going into the cinema. Sit down. You're with your boys. It's nice. 
Next month, ah, round two, you're in again. What? The third month, you're number 51. You don't make it. Mm. But because you've gotten so used to going to the cinema once a month, last Thursday of the month, what are you going to do? You're going to buy a ticket. Mm. And you're going to watch. Or in the first month, you are, you are there and your friends are running late. They're going to buy a ticket because you're already, sorry, you're already inside. <laughs> and you're like, ah, now I'm going to have to wait for this guy. He's getting a lift from me. So I might as well buy a ticket and just watch the movie. Now you're number, number 50 to number 109 are now buying the ticket. That's people that would have never watched, you know. Um, but they're just there because they were ready for a free movie and popcorn and cool drink. Mm. Now you find yourself having to pay for it. But you're building that audience. And, and, and that was the concept. And, and Tom was like, revive that. Let's bring that, that idea back, you know. Let's, let's reach out to people. Let's, let's do it. And I was like, okay, cool. And, and what we then decided to do is like rework it in such a way that we target different cinemas to remind people of the cinema experience, you know, then, or even, not even just that, just like introduce you to a genre you might have never seen. So we don't even tell you the genre. We don't tell you nothing. All you know is the cinema, the date, and the time. Oh. And before you even go inside, we have games mapped out outside. You play games, because if you came alone, you can make some friends. Crazy eight, 30 seconds, all of the things that get you meeting people, that's the point. And then next week, you're like, ah, oh, I bet this is this person I met, <laughs> you know, uh, last week um, or last month or whenever, because the, the, film, the films will release sporadically whenever we get access. Um, but that's, that's the point of the Secret Film Society. It's just yeah. driving people back. That's, that's, I, I love that. I love that idea because, uh, you know, networking tends to be quite a terrifying experience. I mean... <laughs> Uh, was it last week? We went with the team and we went to a, a networking session uh, with an agency. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, you know, it's time for us to network. And I promise you, the three of us were just standing next to each other having a chat until the guy stood up and said, okay, guys, <laughs> by networking, I mean, leave whoever you know. <laughs> and people. Yeah, yeah, speak to other people. <laughs> but it's very difficult, right, mm -hmm. to actually just break that ice and say, who are you? What do you do? Um, what brings you here? So I love that initiative to to get people to, you know, play and, and interact and have a conversation. Yeah. But now we're getting to uh, the lighter side of our show, which is uh, the game segment. Uh, oh, uh, Jules, <laughs> take us away. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, so this one is very Oh, damn. <laughs> Ew, I'm gonna fail. <laughs> okay, yeah. Lord. Okay, yeah. cool. So we just we just pick up our hands. Oh, so it's yeah. you against me. Cool. Uh, cool. Uh, this is unfair advantage. I wanna beat you. <laughs> In house. In house, no. <laughs> I don't know the first. If you win, I'll know it's Yeah, no, don't worry. <laughs> I usually lose, so I'm, 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 today I'm gonna surprise I am myself. Terrible, but okay, go yeah. for it. Okay, so don't worry, it's not too hard. Okay, so cool. I have two internet options. Okay, so this one is called Hey Hey. 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 <laughs> okay, I was still, I was, I was still trying to hear those those names properly. You know, in what, in what? Because I worked on one of their films. Which one? Which one? Can't remember one of them. Were you servicing it? No, no, no. As in marketing. Okay. okay. No, we're not talking nothing. Oh. I don't. It was just the she, marketing campaign. Guys, she knows Jordan Peele. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up for real. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 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 if you're slow, well, no, we like. pick up a hand. No, I, we pick up a hand. You didn't say pick up a hand. Why are Jules. you throwing in rules at the end? She did. Did you? School rules. Pick up a hand. I really gave you the answer though. She did. So we, we're gonna. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so fine. that that question is null and void. That's fine. You still lost. Okay. It's full time. Right. <laughs> Outlaws, 
it is don't do that <laughs> <laughs> it's the one with patu and gradient which one is that it is called give me Come on now. Ah, why are you doing this to me? No, it's he's distracting me knowing no, that okay, I'll forget. No, okay, fine. Okay, it's quiet. his fault. I don't want your five seconds. Give it to me. <laughs> Cheers up Productions. <laughs> Cheers up Films. Cheers, Cheers up Global Boyd. Conglomerate. No. <laughs> Cheers up Pictures. Boyd. Yes. Yes, there we go. It's too late. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking, yeah. You, you got it wrong three times, which means oh, not in point. Just give me one. Yeah. No, give you gave me, me five seconds. <laughs> you gave me five seconds to remember. So yes, three five, is too much. It's one nil. Sure. <laughs> so competitive. I am very competitive. And all we get is a high five now. Don't worry. <laughs> Oksanayo, my street cred is on the line here. So where's your last story? Huh. Rhythm City, guys. Hi, guys. Uh, Not Urban Brew. Okra Media. No. Okay. Is it Urban Brew? No. Yeah. <gasps> Quizzical. Yes. Oh, wow. Oh, Thanks, yes. Kev. Thanks. <laughs> My previous name. Stop Wow. Can I? Can I? Curious Pictures. Boom. I got Why? that one. I just took it away from you. you no, you did not. Okay? So it's still 2 1. Cool. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Okay, there was in the lead. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, inspire the road and Ayala. Boom. That was easy. Yeah. Productions, ah, oh, come ah, on. I oh, had no. My hand up. I had my hand up. I had my hand up. You got it wrong the first time. <laughs> yeah. We just said Bob. <laughs> and I want to say, I'm going to say P. I saw you look at me like. Okay, I want to say. He, get, he must get a half a mark for okay. that, by the way. Yeah, okay. I'm kidding, Shane. Right. <laughs> specific name. Bomb Shelter. Oh, Yay! Okay. <laughs> Okay. I just don't think I know these things. Wow. It's Hello. Just like, surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, A24. Wow. A24. Also, you can tell okay. who I was at school. I wasn't oh. the list that my hand. Yeah, like the teachers like want to give someone else a chance. Be like, no, 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 I know. Now, <laughs> would you give us the answer? I think because I worked on A24. That's why. Have you worked with them? Uh, marketing campaigns in South Africa. Okay. How, how are they? They're very dynamic, ne? I love them. Mm. <laughs> in my future. You're going to be... You're gonna be working in my future, them. if they no. call me, if you want. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing. And expanding right now, man. Be nah, really if you... Close. Where I'm at now is mm. so incredible. It's like the best of the best of the best, which is lovely. And people that are so ahead of their time. Um... So I think A24 should look out for us. Yeah. Love that. Let's get back to the game. Yeah, but... Mm. Um, <laughs> speaking mm. of deep, Alexa, deep cities, boxing day, and Lord help us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, um, can I come on out here? Um, what's this guy's name? I'm not, I don't want to say his name. Wait! So it's tricky. Ne- was it not first of the Clive Morris Productions? And then now it's like. Hey? Yeah, eh? Black Brain. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> that, sorry. Yeah. That was a uh, slow one. I know. Anyway, seriously, to go Onion Productions. Shout out to Burnt Onion. See, we love you, Burnt Onion. Thanks for supporting so us. I think I should lift this on. Oh, I did. Yeah, so she didn't. Yeah, well done now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Um, we'll give you that one. <laughs> I'm not bad. You know what? This show is all about giving the spotlight to the guests. No, so, you lost fair and square. <laughs> 
Women's okay, month or not? I'll take my L. <laughs> You're I'll take lost. My, I'll take my Hard. L. Hard. <laughs> <laughs> We definitely thank definitely. you thanks so much jules so i mean you know with um the vast amount of experience that you've gathered within this past decade um <laughs> still young don't worry very young, we're though. not exposing you <laughs> very very young i'm still in my youth by the way yes you are and it shows in your skin <laughs> um have you you know and i'm sure you've been able to see some archaic ways of doing things and how they don't work in this environment like as you were saying you had to fire your former boss over something very trivial you know yeah my first film boss yes yeah <laughs> and um so i'm sure you've been able to see kind of what works and what doesn't and what's kind of holding us back as a business mm. i don't want to say industry yet because i feel as if we haven't been totally and fully industrialized mm -hmm. but what changes would you like to see within our space uh, going forward in the future i would like to see a lot more planning for marketing especially so start at the beginning not at the end mm -hmm. marketing and distribution plans start at the beginning um i'd like to see a lot more collaboration between creatives creatives with um thinkers and um you know lawyers and accountants and a lot more collaboration in the space i think that would be the ultimate because that's how you grow this industry through collaboration and partnerships i'd like to see a lot more filmmakers taking themselves seriously you know it's one of those things where it's like, I've made this film and then what, right? But if you take yourself seriously, you're like, even if I made this cup of tea, I'm like, I made this cup of tea and this is the person that's going to drink it. And when I'm done with this tea bag, I'm going to take the tea bag and I'm going to create something from it. And, you know, like being very intentional about what you do and your existence. Um, those are the three things that I think I'd want to see. And I think those are the three things that would also... Um, help um, in ensuring that filmmakers get out of themselves, right? And start thinking about the business. Because it's a business. Like any business, you're creating something that's going to last forever, that your kids can watch, that your grandkids can watch, that their grandkids' friends can watch. Um, so that's, that's ideally what I'd want to see. Um, now, we've uh, reached the tail end of uh, our show. Um, you know, having a conversation with you is always interesting. Whether it's over a quick meal or it's just, uh, you know, general getting to understand the ins and outs of this business. You know, you've always been someone who extends themselves to people and uh, it relates with, uh, you know, when someone sees your relationships within the business and in your personal life. So um, today we just want to celebrate you as a woman of virtue a woman who's dynamic and who's changing things within the space. We salute you and we want to say thank you and may your journey be bright as you go forward. Aww, thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.